Hello everybody, Mr. Marg with you, and in this physics video lesson we are going to study the center of mass, which is a way of reducing complicated systems down to a single point. Thus far in physics, we have dealt with simple things like uh, spheres and blocks, squares and cubes and things like that, and, and that's how physicists kind of prefer things. It's actually kind of a meme that if a physicist has a problem with a cow, they're going to start by assuming a spherical cow of uniform density in a vacuum. Like try to reduce things to their most simplest basic form and start from there. It's kind of how physicists deal with things. Uh, but suppose we're trying to deal with something more complex, like comparing a wrench, for example, to a ball. And so in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out how to take complicated things and reduce them down so they look like spherical cows that are a little bit easier to analyze. So before we kind of jump into the idea of center of mass, let's briefly talk about the difference between an object and a system. An object is a thing where the internal structure can be ignored. For instance, you don't care what it's made out of. You don't care how the atoms within it are arranged. You, you just care what the exterior looks like. Uh, physical dimensions are not important, and what the object is isn't important to what it does. So, for example, if you roll something off a table, the physicist doesn't really care what that thing is made out of if he's just looking for how far it's going to roll when it lands on the floor. A system, on the other hand, is a collection of things that you are analyzing together. A system has internal structure that cannot be ignored, and what a system is, is important to what it does. So, for example, an object would be a golf ball rolling off a table. The fact that it is a golf ball made of a different material than a tennis ball doesn't have any effect on the physics of it rolling off a table. An example of a system would be a golf ball that you're trying to dissolve in acid. If you're going to dissolve a golf ball, you care deeply about what it is made out of, the arrangement of the atoms and the molecules that make a golf ball different than a tennis ball. And so sometimes we need to model things as objects, and sometimes we need to model them as systems. If the parts of a system doesn't affect what the system does, then in physics we can model it as an object, as in it doesn't matter what it's made out of, what its internal structure is. And a lot of the things we're going to learn in the second semester uh, are basically how do we take a system and make it look more like an object. That's kind of our goal, simplify a lot of things in physics. And so one thing that's going to help with that is defining the center of mass. The center of mass is the average position of the parts of a system. Um, its definition is basically if you pushed at that point, it's not going to rotate. You can kind of think about it right now as being the balancing point of a system. That's kind of conceptually how most people would understand it. So if you can balance a system at a point, then that point is the center of mass. Now, in real life, you have to consider all three dimensions for like a three-dimensional object. But in AP Physics 1, you'll only be asked to analyze two-dimensional things that can be represented on a piece of paper in a XY coordinate plane. And then the center of mass depends on the mass of the pieces of the system and then how those pieces are arranged. So we have an equation for finding the center of mass. Um, and to find the position of the center of mass, you sum the mass times the position of all the different pieces of the system, and then divide that by the sum of the masses of the pieces of the system. And so if you're not familiar with that symbol, uh, that, that letter is the Greek letter sigma, which means the sum of. You're going to see that a lot in physics and in math. M is the mass of each individual piece that makes up the system, however many you've got. And X is the position of each individual piece on a number line, like an X axis. The vector arrow over the X reminds us that the direction matters. And so being to the right of zero would be positive and being to the left of zero would be negative. When you look at that equation on the formula chart and in textbooks and things like that, um, it's written with these little subscript i's on everything. Um, the i represents the index mathematically. And for us, it really just reminds us that we're supposed to include all the pieces. So i is like for every single piece, piece one, piece two, piece three, all the way to however many pieces you've got. Um, and so I don't typically write it that way with the i's. I feel like it's unnecessary. Uh, but just realize you'll see it written that way in textbooks and the formula chart. So let's look at a simple example. 
Let's suppose on this number line, x-axis if you will, I have a four kilogram object at a position of negative 10 centimeters and a two kilogram object at a position of positive five centimeters. And let's calculate the position of the center of mass. And so the first thing I kind of do is substitute in the masses into the denominator to remind myself that I need to include all of them regardless of where they are at. If something has a position of zero, you may not include it in the numerator, but you still have to include it in the denominator. Then plugging in the mass of each piece multiplied by its position, so four kilograms times negative 10 centimeters for the blue thing, two kilograms times five centimeters for the red thing, um, kind of reducing all that down, doing a little bit of mass simplification here, uh, kind of reduce that to negative 30, that's what you get in the numerator, uh, kilograms times centimeter over six kilograms, the total mass of that system, uh, and then doing some dividing gives me a center mass position of negative five centimeters. The kilograms would cancel out right there. And so there's a symbol kind of like that one right there, like a quarter shaded circle, if you will, that is often used to represent the center of mass. So if I kind of put that on the x-axis at negative five centimeters, that point would tell me where I could balance that system if I so chose. And so this is kind of a relatively straightforward, if somewhat messy sometimes, um, substitution into an equation. Just plug everything in. Uh, you got to keep track of your signs. Uh, that's important. Um, and, and kind of you know pull the crank on the math machine and see what you get. So kind of the follow-up question is, what if we move that number line around? It's like, what if we slid the number line so that the four kilogram object was now at zero? That would cause the other two kilogram object to be at 15 centimeters. So I haven't moved the objects and how they're um, located relative to each other. All I've done is move the number line around. And what that does, when I kind of start substituting into our equation again, it doesn't change the denominator. Like I'm still going to get six kilograms for the mass of the system, but it does change the numerator. And so notice that in the substitution there, the blue term is going to end up being zero because the four kilogram object is now at zero and the red one is going to have a position of 15. So I'm going to get a different number here. Um, I'm going to get five centimeters at the end of this. So the center of mass is now at the five centimeter position. But if we kind of superimpose these two pictures over each other a little bit, it's the same position. So I've just changed what that position is relative to when I moved my coordinate system around. And so when you're doing these sorts of things, um, the selection of the coordinate system is arbitrary. Like there's no real right or wrong answer for where zero should be when you're finding the center of mass of a system. Oftentimes in you know physics problems and things like that, somebody will define it for you. Um, oftentimes it's, it's chosen to be a relatively simple um, coordinate system, but if that's not chosen for you, you of course have the power to decide. So make it to where the situation is easy for you to understand. Let's talk a little bit about what happens when you have a two-dimensional object. And so x in the equation x center of mass equals refers to an x position. You could just as easily replace the x's with y's and find a y or vertical position. And so like a lot of things in physics, we have two directions. We just treat each direction separately um, and calculate the results independently. And so in this case, we're going to do two um, calculations one for the horizontal center of mass and one for the vertical center of mass. So in this coordinate system, I got two things. And just for simplicity's sake, we're going to make them both have a mass of 0.5 kilograms, half a kilogram. And the red thing is located at negative 1, 3. And the blue thing is located at 4, 2. Just x, y coordinate pairs, just like in pre-algebra. So to find the center of mass, um, we're going to find the x position first. And so plugging in the two masses in the denominator, and then m times x for each one in the numerator. So 0.5 kilograms times an x position of 4 centimeters, and then repeat that for a position of negative 1 centimeter for the red thing. Um, do some mass simplification there. You get 1.5 over 1, which reduces to 1.5. 
So the X center of mass must be at an X coordinate of 1.5 centimeter. I can't make that a, a dot just yet, but I can make it into a line. So somewhere along that line is where I'm going to find the center of mass. The X coordinate has to be 1.5 centimeters. Uh, just repeat for the Y coordinate. Instead of using the X values, just use the Y values. So same initial substitution, the, the denominator is still going to be one kilogram because the mass of the system is the same in both axes. Um, this time I'm going to replace the X coordinates with the Y coordinates. So for the blue object, I'm going to use a Y value of two centimeters. For the red, I'm going to use a Y value of three centimeters. And then again, just kind of pulling the crank on the math handle. Um, that's going to give me 2.5 over one for a value of 2.5 centimeters. So the Y coordinate being 2.5 centimeters means that the center mass must lie along that line, the purple line. So where those two lines intersect is where I'm going to find the center mass of the system. And I can express that as an XY um, coordinate pair, 1.5 centimeters comma 2.5 centimeters. And so the trick in, in analyzing something in two dimensions is just to treat those two dimensions independently of each other and then you're reporting both coordinates, an X and a Y in this case. If you have a uniform system, like a rod or a disc or a hoop, the center of mass is going to be at its geometric center. So you don't have to do a calculation to figure out where the center of mass of a meter stick is, for instance. You know it's going to be at its geometric center, which is conveniently located at 50 centimeters. So we're going to do a lot of labs with meter sticks and discs because they are uniform, and I know that the center mass of a uniform system is going to be at its geometric center. Um, you wouldn't be asked to find the center of mass of something that isn't highly symmetrical, like these three things here. So for instance, if I took a chunk out of that hoop and asked you where the center of mass was, that would be more something you would study in um, AP Physics C, like a calculus-based physics course. In AP Physics 1, we're just expected to find the center of highly symmetric system. So let's do one last example together where I have a long rod of mass six kilograms and then we put our four kilogram object um, there kind of sort of at the end. So kind of like before, our first job is to figure out a coordinate system. So in this case I'm going to put the coordinate system such that zero is at its center, the center of the rod that is, um, which is going to make the math just a little bit easier. I could put it anywhere I like, but I need to put it in a spot that's convenient for me. So again, substituting into the center mass equation, doing the masses first on the denominator, that's going to give me 10 total kilograms. Um, the blue thing, the four kilogram object, is at a position of 10 centimeters. And the rod, the red thing, is at a position of zero centimeters. So the mass on the right side and the mass on the left side balance each other out. Let's put the center mass of just the rod at zero. Um, so that becomes that term becomes zero. The blue term is 40 kilograms times centimeter. The mass of the rod does count in the denominator, which is why I recommend you do that a little bit first. Uh, so you get a denominator of 10, and then kind of pull on the crank on the math handle, you get an x position for the center mass of about four centimeters. And so the heavier that rod gets, the closer the center mass is going to move towards the center. And in class, we'll do things um, to kind of feel that. We'll, we'll put things on meter sticks, move them around, um, change the mass of those things to get a feel for how the center mass moves as we move the pieces around. So the center of mass is a really important physics concept that we're going to really be revisiting all year. Um, in just about every unit we study, there's some important aspect of the center of mass because we're always looking to take complicated things and make them simple if possible. And the first step in doing that in a lot of cases is to consider just the center of mass rather than the motion of an entire extended body. So throwing a dodgeball is just like throwing a wrench in a lot of cases because the center of mass of a wrench moves just like a dodgeball. So once again, we've proven if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. We'll be working on that in class, so bring your helmet for playing Dodge Wrench, and I'll see you all then. Da-da.